Well, good morning, Bay Park, and welcome on this Sunday morning. My name is Rachel, and I'm one of the people on staff here, and it's so good to be together this morning. If you are new here, our desire as a church is to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. And so you'll notice throughout our service that we keep looking to Jesus, and especially in this series in Proverbs, even on these conversations of marriage and sexuality, we keep looking to Jesus to find the answer. Answers. If at any time you've got any questions or want to connect or are looking for prayer online, you can connect with our host online. You can either click the request prayer button or there'll be a button in the chat and you can connect with the host in that way. Well, uh, at church, we now have two services happening here in the building in the auditorium, 8.30 and 10 a.m., plus in the cafe and in 202 for the toddlers and their parents. And so there are some significant uh, services happening here, and it is so exciting. One of my favorite things is I often am working away, and I'll keep up the registration list, and as people register, I'll be like, all these people coming, and it just feels so exciting. And I get really excited. I just anticipate Sunday mornings. But having all of these services meaning, means there's some significant needs. And so, Bay Park, I just want to challenge you and ask you to pray with us. Pray specifically that God will provide people to serve in some of these needed areas so we can continue meeting these needs and having these services. And while you're doing that, be prepared that you might be the one that the Holy Spirit nudges and say, do you know what? I need to serve. And so if that's the case, at any time, you can just let a host know online or you can connect with the office, office at baypark.ca. And uh, we'll hopefully find an area to plug you in where you can serve in an area of gifting and with great joy and meaning and purpose. And so it's, it's an exciting position to be in. Well, upcoming, not this Sunday, but next Sunday, next week, we are having a Hot Seat Sunday. And so if you are new to Bay Park and you've never been here, Hot Seat Sunday is when Paul and Ryan go on the hot seat and live in real time, people text in their questions or send them in on the online platform, and then they get put on the screen and Ryan and Paul see them for the very first time and then have to answer them on the spot. And this is because in real life, often these conversations with our neighbor, or like through the fence, or with a friend when you're on the walk, or, or maybe at work in the break room, conversations about religion and spiritual things come up often. And often they're like difficult to answer, and you don't have time to prepare, and you don't have very long. And so this is a way for us to model and example how some of these conversations can be had and also hopefully answer some of your questions that you have as, our, as the church here at Bay Park. And so we want to encourage you to send in some questions. We will be taking them live in real time. But sometimes it is helpful to kind of know, okay, this is where the area that people are wanting and curious about. And so send in your questions uh, online. There'll be a little button in the chat and you can just click that button and type in your question there. Don't worry, all questions remain anonymous. No names will be announced. And then if you, in particular, if you send in a question regarding marriage, sex, or Proverbs, then there is a, there's a Starbucks gift card if uh, your question is asked on a Sunday morning. Well, before we go any further, Bay Park, let's just pray for this service and this Sunday ahead of us. Father, thank you. Thank you for this Sunday, this incredible privilege it is as a small portion of your body, the church, to gather together, to worship your name, to recognize your holiness, to learn from your word. And we just pray that we'd look to Jesus, the perfect uh, example of wisdom embodied, and that we would uh, put aside some of our own uh, expectations and really lean in and listen with open ears and minds and hearts to what you're wanting us to say or what you're wanting us to learn. And Holy Spirit, we just pray. We pray for your filling for Paul and Laurelyn as they speak, as they communicate from your word. We pray uh, that it would come into our hearts and we would listen with open ears and respond in the way that you're calling us to live in purity and holiness and in perfect union with you, God. Thank you that we are able to have relationship with you, God, because of Jesus because of your work on the cross. And so this morning, we just give you the honor and the glory, and we thank you for who you are and what you've done and how you invite us into relationship with you. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Ooh. 
Holy Spirit, guide my vision, help me see the way you see. Always Jesus, ever Jesus Christ, in all is Christ in me. Holy Spirit, guide my speaking words of grace and truth without Let my lips be filled with stories of the mercy that I found. You're the light, you're my path, you're the shepherd of my soul. All I am, all I have, Holy Spirit, lead me on. Holy Spirit, guide my hearing, wake my ears to words you speak. Well, I'd like to add my good morning to you this morning, church. I have some exciting news to share with you, some family news. We welcome not only to this world, but to the Bay Park family, Isla May Foster, born to Hannah and Tegan Foster this past week. And so to the Foster clan, we rejoice with you and we thank God for the arrival of Isla. Also, some other exciting news is we have Terrence, Tara and Stephen McLewain, who have requested membership, and they have been interviewed, and so we look forward to receiving them in membership. But first, members, if you have any questions, hit the button, connect with an elder, and we will get back to you. And for those who aren't members, if you are interested in membership, we would love to hear from you if you want to find out more. So again, hit the button, 
and request a, just a, a conversation about membership and we'll get in touch with you. It's exciting to have a young family uh, like the McLewains join Bay Park not only and get involved, but also say, hey, we want to be members here. Plant our flag here. And they're involved and a vibrant part of our family, and so we rejoice with them. Speaking of exciting news, I still remember when Laurel Lynn and I got engaged some 33 years ago. It was an exciting time for both of us. I also remember going to work at the time. I was working full-time, and I remember going to work and, and letting all my coworkers and supervisors and boss know that, that we were engaged, and I was shocked that they weren't as excited for me as I was. In fact, not only were they not excited, but, but I got a lot of real downer questions, things like, oh, you're doing the ball and chain thing? Really? Or aren't you going to get bored just being married to one partner for the rest of your life? And, and so th there was this constant barrage. But, but not only was there this constant negative barrage, my supervisor himself made it his personal mission to try and dissuade me, to try and change my mind. So every time we hopped in the car together, we were going out on a call together, he was constantly after me. That was some 33 years ago. Um, I know both Laura Lynn and I look so young in that picture, and that's because, friends, we were young, very, very young. Uh, we're so glad we got married, but you know, when it comes to marriage, attitudes have just eroded even further. Not only do people today continue to look at marriage with, with an increased sarcasm, but marriage has become it's like buying a flat screen TV. It's, it's a consumer transaction instead of being a covenant. It's a consumer transaction. What's in it for me? We want guarantees. No marriage without first test driving it extensively first. And, and it's only good until something better comes along the next upgrade. And that's the problem. That's the problem. Marriage is a covenant. Marriage is not a commodity nor is it even a contract. It's a covenant. I've shared this definition with you before of a covenant from Nancy Pearson, so let me share it with you again. In a covenant, we do not agree to perform a service. Rather, we acquire a status as children of God, as husband or wife, as mother or father. We do not agree to provide a product. We pledge our very selves for better or for worse. A covenant is not limited in duration. It's forever, and we do not set the terms. They are already defined. We accept an array of obligations and responsibilities that are prior to our choice. Defined by God, expressed in the moral law, and based on human nature as God created it. Well, guess what topic we're going to be looking at today as we pick up where we left off in Proverbs, the art of living. Last week, we were in Proverbs chapter 5, and yes, today we're going to be talking about marriage. This is our last installment for now in Proverbs. We will probably be coming back to Proverbs maybe next spring or summer. But for now, our last uh, installment, picking up where we left off in Proverbs chapter 5. So grab your Bible or electronic device and find Proverbs chapter 5, we're going to be picking up in verse 15. I love the beauty, I love that the beauty of marriage comes after last week's talk on promiscuity, verses 1 through 14 of chapter 5. A good defense against promiscuity is a healthy marriage. Well, let's dive into our text. Follow along as I read, starting with verse 15. Drink water from your own cistern running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares? Let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? For the, your ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all your paths. 
The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them. The cords of their sins hold them fast. For the lack of discipline, they will die, led astray by their own great folly. Well, the last few weeks, my goal has been to keep this PG. But it's, but it's kind of hard with such explicit verses. And normally our, our habit on the Sunday would be to, you know, unpack verse by verse in some detail. But, but we're not doing that this morning because the detail, the graphic detail is already there in the verses. And may I say this, if, if you don't understand what these verses are about, well, we have a man named Matt. He's an elder here at Bay Park, and he's also taught sex ed. Just come and see me, and I will introduce you to Matt. And as one of our drummers said, tell people not to Google this. Seriously, do not Google this. I think it's pretty clear, friend, that you and I can agree that that God and the Bible are not anti-sex. That's an old myth. Here's a broad view of these verses. I'm just going to pull out some principles. So so first principle that we find in this passage concerning marriage and what it is, is, and we're going to see why it is so good. The first thing is marriage is exclusive. Marriage is exclusive. That's verses 15 through 17. Look at the first part of verse 15. Drink water from your own cistern. We we drink to quench our thirst. And so too our sexual desires were meant to be quenched in the exclusive lifelong covenant of marriage by, by God's design. Verse 17. Let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. Love desires permanency, exclusivity, Ed, a really good friend of mine for over some, about 30 years now. And this past summer, um, as we gathered together uh, once again, traveled to meet each other, we had an opportunity to, to walk and pray. And that's what we do. We, we walk, and as we walk, we talk, and we pray. And so one of the subjects of conversation that just came up, and I don't know who brought it up, but it just came up was, well, Paul, Ed, what, what, what would you do if, if Laura Lynn or Crystal died? And and we both thought as we were walking and talking that, well, number one, that's not going to happen because we're, we're going to die before our wives. And especially in my case, I've done a lot of stupid things that has probably shortened my life somewhat. But then as we continued to ponder this, we, we both agreed that it's, that's really hard to conceive. It's really hard to think about because of, of where we are now today in our relationships, in terms of, of the depth of joy and the companionship. I mean, we weren't saying it, it wouldn't or couldn't, but, but that we just, it was hard to conceive. Especially, you know, you look back and you think of, of year one of marriage, or even of year 10, and you realize, wow, it's taken years and, and tears to come to this point of depth of relationship. I, I can't help but think of, Tim and Kathy Keller, a a quote from them, and it says, when over the years someone has seen you at your worst and knows you with all your strengths and flaws, yet commits him or herself to you wholly, it is a consummate experience. To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from, the preten- from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. And that kind of relationship, that kind of companionship, comes from treating marriage as a covenant and seeing marriage as exclusive. So marriage is exclusive. We see that in the text. We also see that marriage is lifelong. That's verse 18. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Well, there's some obvious implications, I think, from this. Implication number one, they weren't youths anymore. Which leads us to implication number two, sex doesn't have to become a boring. Hollywood has it all wrong. The best sex is not for the young and the promiscuous. Contrary to all the ribbing and I would even say the selfish fears of my coworkers. One partner is not boring at all. Like a good wine, treat it right and it just gets better. Especially in the context of a covenant marriage, of the exclusivity of marriage. 
lifelong marriage. Look, I'm not saying that there were no rough patches or difficulties. A marriage isn't some kind of magical pixie dust that, that in and of itself just makes you happy ever after no matter what. No, no, no. God blesses and multiplies what you and I put into marriage. It's work. It's sacrifice. I mean, verse 23 is bang on. It's, it's discipline. It takes God-guided and strengthened and empowered discipline. It's called learning to love one another unconditionally, just as God loves you and me. Unconditional love is covenant love, by the way. A big part of marriage is, is learning to get over yourself, to deny yourself. Kevin Lehman, in his book, Sheet Music, says this, the best way to improve your sex life is to focus on the other 95% of your marriage and build that up. And so marriage is exclusive, marriage is lifelong, and marriage is meant to be intoxicating. That's verses 19 through 20. Uh, during the Middle Ages, many uh, Christians, most Christians, saw uh, sex as just for procreation, not for pleasure, which is really odd when you think of other Bible passages, uh, not just here in Proverbs, but also like 1 Corinthians 7 or Ephesians 5, which talk about sex and marriage, and, and procreation is not even mentioned. But anyways, if you were a, a Catholic, for example, uh, married during the Middle Ages, you were told not to have sex on, on Sundays with your spouse, nor on religious holy days, uh, and not for 20 days before Christmas, and not for 40 days before Easter, and, and definitely not for the three days before taking of communion. Basically, as little as possible. As Christians, we, we need to, to own our failures, becoming so prudish as to, as to call what God called good, and, and for us to call it, it bad, is, well, that's, that's that's actually unholy. It's also unhealthy. It creates all kinds of false guilt, which I have seen, actually. And it also creates a forbidden fruit syndrome, the very opposite of, of, of what the prudishness is meant to create. Verse 19b says, May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Wow, what a powerful word. Intoxicated with her love overcome, uh, taken captive. There's nothing intoxicating about self-gratification sex or consumer marriage. Marriage and sex were designed by God to be a means of giving, not, not taking. Marriage is more than, than just saying, I love you and I want to be with you. It's a covenant before God in which a wife and a husband say, I take all of you, your past, your present, your future, your strengths and your hang-ups, your, your joys and your pain, your finances and your debts. And not just for the fun times, but also for the frustrating times. Marriage is not the ceremony. It's not the reception, no matter what people show on Instagram. That's not Marriage, that's not what it is. Nor is marriage just a piece of paper. Not at all. It's a covenant, an exclusive, lifelong covenant. One in which sex is just one part of the oneness that is being experienced. And it's so gratifying, even when it's far from perfect. And it will always be far from perfect. But it can be really good. Well, it's been 33 years since uh, that day when some people thought that Laura Lynn and I were crazy for getting married, and I thank God we did. And I'm also thankful that Laura Lynn is here to come and to share with us this morning. And so, Laura Lynn, come on up. So if you haven't met Laura Lynn, this is Laura Lynn. 
Um, and I want you to know that, that Laura Lynn, those 33 years ago, Laura Lynn was crazy, crazy, crazy about me. And not only was she really crazy about me, she's the one who chased after me, but also, like, as far as matches go, we were like a match made in heaven. Like, our personalities are just, they jive, they click. Our interests, our passions are all the same. So it was just like, easy peasy. Funny nah. what age does to you. <laughs> yeah, it, oh, it, memory. <laughs> nah, it wasn't at all. It wasn't at all. Uh, before we met, we had both been in some pretty serious and significant relationships. And, and I'm just thinking back. It has been 33 years, but I'm just thinking back um, on what, what really drew me to you was, was beauty. And not just beauty, but the, I'd say beauty in two parts. There's the physical beauty, but there was also a spiritual beauty about you that I knew that when it came to your faith, specifically to following and pursuing Jesus, that that was more important to you than anything else, including a relationship. And to me, that was something that was really attractive. And I thought, I can see God at work in her. And I also valued the fact that we weren't exactly the same. I mean, you were an English major, I was a business major. Our interests very, very different, and so our personalities. That's my cue. Yeah. <laughs> I can honestly say that it was very much the same, though, as far as what attracted me. I can remember watching you talk to people who were kind of those people that are on the fringe of a group and making them feel just as valued. And I thought, wow, that's a gift. And um, we were university students at the time, and there was no Christian witness on our campus, and uh, we decided that there should be, and you just went ahead and got that all going, and I thought, wow, his faith isn't just something that he talks about, it's something he lives. And so those were things that very much, and I mean, there were other things that came along <laughs> after that, but I just remember thinking, wow. That's pretty rare. So, well, it's it's. Thank you, and it's interesting to look back and just to remember those times. And and obviously, a lot has happened in between those times. I mean, it has been thirty three years. It's hard to believe. Um, I just thinking of a, a a quote here from Cheryl Whitstein, and she did some research, and this is what she discovered. She discovered, and I'm quoting here: "People who divorce are not, on average, more happy than spouses who stay in difficult marriages." In fact, most spouses who stick with difficult marriages are much happier five years later. To be clear, and we talked about this, as, as I mentioned before, just getting married is no guarantee of bliss, you know, forever after. We live in a very fallen and a broken world. Both Laura Lynn and I have grieved with people who spouses who have given themselves um, in their marriage, and it was not... It, it's not that it just wasn't reciprocated, it was used even as manipulation against them. And we've grieved with people that have really have been in some very painful and broken situations. And, and so there are very valid reasons to divorce. And, and you know, not the least of which is, you know, when there's, when there's emotional or physical abuse and violence and, 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 and adultery, unrepentant adultery. But that being aside, what, what the research is saying is what we already, I think, know intui intuitively is that people often give up on a marriage way too early over issues that shouldn't be covenant breakers. And so was it ever hard really coming down to, was it ever hard? I, mean, I already know the answer to that, but I think it's helpful to talk about it openly, right? Was it ever hard? You know, it's interesting because as I was thinking about that, I was thinking of, well, um, we were not able to conceive, and that was a difficult time. And I was thinking of big events, but honestly, I would say the hardest times were when I was blasé, whether it was, and mostly about my faith, actually, just very blasé, and it worked itself into being blasé about my marriage. And that 
takes a toll. And as you go down that road, things do start to fall apart. And the, the desire for a really meaningful relationship and a, a healthy, fun marriage um, gets overtaken by this meh feeling. Um, and it was terrible. It was... I could see, humanly speaking, why people would give up on that, but I, I knew that wasn't, that wasn't an option. And as I allowed God to repair my relationship with Him, the wonder that He worked in a, my human relationship, especially with Paul, was, was amazing to see. And so the hard times really were, and it, it may sound like a pat answer that, you know, well, when I wasn't being following Christ, that, but it's very true. Um, when I had allowed my wants and my desires to supersede those of, of what God delights in, it, it all went south. Wow. Oh. I, I so appreciate hearing you say that because we haven't actually talked about our answers. Um, and so I'm just hearing this as you are. And I mean, my mind could go to times where I'm thinking, I was just a jerk. I really was. And so I was thinking, okay, she'll probably bring up, you know, this time or that time. But it's interesting the way you say, you say it because that's what I was thinking too. Like the hard times were really times where I was just self-absorbed. And so self-absorbed and selfish that, that the marriage didn't have a chance to thrive. Um, and, and by the way, that kind of selfishness, a new partner is not going to fix that, right? But sticking through the marriage actually um, really did. The movie Captain Corelli's Mandolin of Nicolas Cage and Penelope, Penelope Cruz um, fame has this beautiful exchange where a wise father talks to his daughter about a recent infatuation. It goes something like this. When you fall in love, it's temporary madness. It erupts like an earthquake and then it subsides. And when it subsides, you have to make a choice. Love is not breathlessness. Love is not excitement. Love is not the desire to be intimate every second of the day. Love is not lying awake at night imagining that he is kissing you. No, don't blush. I'm telling you the truth. That's just being in love, which any of us can convince ourselves that we are. Love itself is what is left over when being in love has burned away. Doesn't sound very exciting, does it? But it is. And I know you like that quote. Um, thoughts on it? Yeah, I really, I really do, because I think... You know, we think of all of those ushy-gushy feelings and think, oh, after 33 years, how can that even exist? And maybe it doesn't exist in the same way. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it doesn't. But the depth of, of companionship and joy that we have in, in just having fun together and, and doing things together. Um, I can honestly say that when we are on vacation, the thing I don't like the most is, and it's usually you that has to go back to work because in the summer I get lots of holiday. Orlin's <laughs> a teacher. She's a teacher. And so I don't like It's like, well, now what am I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> so, like... The joy, the honest joy of just, yeah. You know, it's interesting. I can say the same because I remember in our younger years, we used to do things even vacation-wise with other people, not always together, like to go out with the guys. But, I mean, I'm pretty jealous of my time off, um, whether it includes you or not, because there is just, it's, it's, it's not a, you know, this crutch. It's more, it's this joy. We just have so much fun being together. But that comes of years of working through marriage, a covenant marriage, exclusive, with a lifelong view, and, and knowing that marriage is intended by God to be something beautiful, which takes us to the final section. There is a final section in here that we need to look at. The last thing is, is that marriage is also 
are sacred. Sex and marriage is sacred. It, look at with us at verse 21 through 23. Laura Lynn, would you mind reading in Proverbs um, 21, Proverbs 5, 21 through 23, just for us that last section? For the Lord sees clearly what a man does, examining every path he takes. An evil man is held captive by his own sins. They are ropes that catch and hold him. He will die for lack of self-control. He will be lost because of his great foolishness. Hmm. Sex is more than an act. It's more than an orgasm. There is a spiritual dimension to it that unites people in a powerful way, especially in the covenant of marriage. God calls it being one flesh. Now, if you're familiar with Horcruxes um, in the Harry Potter uh, fantasy movies or, or books, um, there are Horcruxes. And, and Lord Voldemort, evil Lord Voldemort, he, he's, he's split, he's divided his soul and and the way he keeps himself alive is by fragmenting his soul and, and hiding parts of his soul in these objects, these horcruxes. Because sex is sacred, when we, when we have indiscriminate sex, be it adultery, an affair, sexting, or something over a webcam, it's like giving away a piece of our soul. Ergo, why the warning here? Faithfulness matters to God because that's who God is. And that's who God has called us to be. God knows that this is for our good. So the beauty of marriage is, is that it's like living out of the gospel. It connects us to, to the very God who created us, and it connects us to his, not only his heart, but to who he is in his character. God is faithful. When Christ hung on the cross, arms outstretched and hands and, and feet nailed to the cross, he, he wasn't thinking, this is worth it because they are so adorable, lovable. No, not at all. Not at all. He didn't think this is worth it because they're, they're so attractive to me. No, Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. He stayed not because we were lovely, but so that he could make us lovely. Now, picking up on, on God's radical sacrifice, his faithful love, unconditional love to us, Paul says in Ephesians 5 that God had the gospel in mind when he created marriage. The gospel came first, and marriage is, is an example of it. And so marriage will only work to the degree that, that it seeks to echo the very heart and character of of God, faithfulness, unconditional covenant love. And when we invite God to love, to, to love in and through us like Jesus, we experience a oneness with God that is even greater than that of marriage. And will also carry us through the hardships of marriage if we are married. I think it's so fitting that, that today on this morning, we're here we're talking about marriage and we're also celebrating, partaking of communion. And so Laura Lynn and I consider it a deep privilege to, to lead you into communion, the joy of remembering who we are and how we are loved. A communion is for believers, for those who have understood God's covenant love and God, how God would not stop at anything to take us, rebellious us, broken us, sinful us, and to bring us back to himself. And that is why Jesus died in our place. It's for those who have cast and are continuing to cast their very lives upon the life-giving grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. If you haven't already, now's the time to actually go and get your communion bread and juice. And we're going to start, uh, really, our time of communion by giving all of us an opportunity to pray for personal prayer. And what would we pray about in personal prayer? Well, it's a time to thank God for his faithfulness, thinking of the gospel and what God has done, not only creating us, but redeeming us and the promises that he has for us because of his faithful covenant love to us, just to take time and to thank God for his covenant love for us. But it's also an opportunity, as we thank God for his covenant love for us, 
It's also an opportunity to, for us to confess where we've fallen short in, in our lack of faithfulness. Our lack of faithfulness maybe is towards God. And Laura Lynn shared a bit about that. Um, the lack of faithfulness can be, yes, in marriage, towards a spouse. Lack of faithfulness can also be towards family. Lack of faithfulness can also be in our calling to love our neighbor, whatever it is, to confess it, knowing that, yes, as we've seen in this passage, nothing is hidden from God, and God cares about faithfulness. But here's the beauty as we confess it. He is faithful. That's a scriptural verse. He is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins. And that's what communion is about. There'll be some passages scrolling on the screen to help uh, you in your prayers. And, and at an appropriate time, um, Laura Lynn and then I will close our time of prayer. So let's, let's start this time in, in looking forward to communion together and partaking of communion together first by praying. So let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your faithfulness, for your great faithfulness. You are faithful in your character. You faithfully display righteousness and truth. You faithfully love us. There is no shadow of change or of wavering in who you are. You are faithful to your promises. You will never leave us or forsake us. Our, the covenant that you have made with us through the blood of Christ, you will be faithful to 100%. You are faithful despite our unfaithfulness. Even when we stray far, you are still faithful. And Father, as we come before you acknowledging this, we cry out to you and ask that you would make us like you in faithfulness. Faithful to your word faithful to you. And God, we thank you that you have provided that way that for us to be faithful, that we are really often characterized by faithfulness, by unfaithfulness. And yet you have provided the way through Jesus Christ, whom we remember now, his death, his body broken, his blood shed, his agony, his pain, his suffering, the giving up of his life, of his, of his place, of humbling himself and taken upon the cross that we might be forgiven, that the penalty of, of our faithlessness and our unfaithfulness, past, present, and even future, might be forgiven, that we might be healed and that we might be loved, <laughs> indwelt by your Holy Spirit, called your children and guided in your love to live in newness of life and to your glory. And so we thank you for this opportunity as a church to, to partake of the bread and of the cup, remembering how faithful you are in your call to faithfulness to us, for your providing the way and for your forgiving. Thank you for hearing all of our prayers. In Jesus' name, and together we can say.
blessed my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. I invite you, friend, to take the bread that you have prepared, and to, friend, as you hold your piece of bread, listen as I read from Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Take of Christ's body, the bread in remembrance of Christ's body broken for you and for me. In Galatians 2.20, we read, My old self has been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's partake of the cup together. Amen. Friend, it has been a delight to be able to worship together today, and I'm so glad that Laurel and I could share our hearts with you. We are praying for you, Bay Park, and rooting for you, but most of all, God, God loves you, and His grace is upon you. I just want to remind you, Hot Seat Sunday is coming up next Sunday, and we will give a Starbucks card to those who have put in questions today. If we use your question on Sunday, you get a Starbucks card. We, the questions, when we use them, they're anonymous. Um, but if you type in a question today concerning Proverbs, sex, or marriage, and we use that question, you get a Starbucks card. God is with you. Go in peace.
breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.